In this video we want to talk about employee relations. Just set up the scene, see what, it's, uh, what it does or what it studies and what are the issues involved in the study of employee relations and the context in which employee relations is set. So let's start by looking at the origins of industrial relations because employee relations as we'll see later is a new term or a relatively new term uh, originally it was known as industrial relations and indeed people almost talk about the two terms interchangeably but it really started with uh, industrial relations now the concept of industrial relations was influenced by the industrial revolution of the 19th century uh, during the period of the Industrial Revolution, there was a uh, it was a traumatic time for people. Uh, people were moving off land. There was a, a movement away from agriculture and towards industry. But the conditions in industry were horrific. The conditions were terrible, and the workers had to endure long hours, sometimes very low pay. Um, dangerous conditions and their lifespan was very short as a consequence but also there were a lot of injuries and there was no compensation so it was a very in a sense primitive time it was a very hard time for those people affected but they had no choice it was work or starve so industrial relations had it had its foundations really with the the formation of the unions the trade unions when workers start to combine come together and speak with one voice which was more of a a balance for management in other words the management was now confronted by a very strong voice on the other side and they could withhold their uh, labor so out of this a, a bargaining situation emerged Prior to the formation of the unions, it was just individual workers talking to the employer. Well, that was a very unfair uh, exchange of, of comments, perhaps, because the individual worker did not have power. If the individual worker upset the management, he or she could lose the job and hence lose income. So the formation of the unions was a shift. and it was opposed of course by by management uh, governments instituted laws against trade unions and there was a long period in which the unions were agitating and struggling to get recognized and to be allowed uh, now of course we accept trade unions as part and parcel of industrial relations or employee relations as we call it now the employee relations scene but somewhere back in the 19th century, back in the 1800s, uh, there were the, the seeds for industrial relations. At that time it would be truly industrial relations. There was no great service sector back at that time. The Industrial Revolution set the beginning of modern employment relations between employers and employees. It was the Industrial Revolution and uh, many great minds have tried to work out what caused the Industrial Revolution. Was it a coincidence in time that there were several innovations and discoveries of techniques and uh, there were great inventive minds around at the time. Um, but despite all of the great achievements, uh, the people who did the, the hard work these are the ones that we are concerned with. We're looking at the interplay between the people and the management. We're looking at the relationship between management, the owners perhaps of the mines or the owners of the railways, the relationship between those people and the people who did the, the physical work. So it emerged in that period there were a lot of struggles, uh, a lot of issues, uh, some terrible events happened, uh, people were killed and and so on. And it was it was a, a really hard time to earn a living. 
But out of that, there grew more of a balance, probably with the development of the trade unions, as I said. And this balance enabled the two sides to, to talk more equally. And that really was the origins of industrial relations. The 19th century saw a vast movement uh, towards the creation of free labour markets, job creation, large-scale industrial organisations. The 19th century was an amazing time in terms of economic history. It seemed like everything was changing. There were new inventions almost every day. And whilst at the latter end of the 20th century we often talk about this great period of innovation in the 20th century with the advent of computers and the internet and, and so on. Back in the 19th century there was this amaz amazing movement uh, as well. This time from labour uh, so, sorry, labour moving from land to industry and then coping with the, the rigours of the situation that they found themselves in. It wasn't very enlightened management. There were employers around who were sympathetic towards the workers, but a lot were not. So the, the seeds for the need for an industrial relations framework were planted in this period. This created a need to employ thousands of wage workers to work in industry and manual labour. The Industrial Revolution required armies of people to to work for them, to, to work in uh, making iron, to work in the mines, to work in, in with fabrics in Lancashire and uh, right throughout the country there were large numbers of people implied and but as I said implied under really terrible conditions and dangerous conditions long hours little money there was malnutrition there was uh, no real health system and when accidents happened they were left unattended perhaps so there was this great movement of people away from agriculture into industry and the needs for uh, some sort of framework became apparent. During the Industrial Revolution uh, countries wis witnessed uh, massive economic and social change which had a direct impact on organizations and their labor force. It wasn't just in England. There, there were movements right across the world uh, what happened in England got there a little before everyone else. Uh, the the innovations that occurred in England with, let's say, the use of iron and with some of the, the key scientific developments and uh, the use of uh, electric power and coal power and uh, mostly the use of coal and steam. But these just got there a little before perhaps other people. But right across the world there were countries experiencing the same sort of movements from agriculture to industry and the same terrible conditions uh, applying in different countries. So clearly there was a need to have a better framework for employee relations or industrial relations as we're calling it here. Clearly there was a need for that. Clearly uh, something had to be done to enable the workers to be dealt with fairly and safely. Labour problems arose such as low wages, long working hours, dangerous work and abusive management and supervisory uh, work ethic. So the workers were broadly in many parts were abused. They had low wages, long working hours, sometimes very dangerous work. Um, <coughs> children were employed at a very young age and worked under uh, terrible conditions. But families 
needed the income to survive. So it was a situation of exploiting poverty and that's the way it came across in many industries and in many areas. So therefore there was a need for something to happen, for some talking and negotiations and a more equal treatment between labour and capital. And there were very enlightened uh, producers as well who tried to help, but they were in such a minority that they did not make a, a significant impact. So it all resulted in a high employee turnover, uh, violent strikes for employee rights and threats of st uh, social instability. This created the need for industrial relations. Back in the uh, 1800s there, was, there were lots of movements, particularly in Europe, towards socialism. Uh, Karl Marx uh, in 1848 uh, published the Communist Manifesto. Now Marx believed that for communism to come about it would only happen in a country with an industrial sector. So Marx, a German, uh, went to live in London because he believed that the revolution that would bring about communism would have to start in England because that's where there was a proletariat, that's where there were uh, an industrialized labor force. And because of their conditions were so poor and because of the uh, low salaries and low wages uh, there would be a lot of discontent amongst the workers and the revolution would start in, in England. So he believed that the revolution would start uh, in the UK. It, there was also socialist movements of course in Europe as well. but. The ruling class, the politicians and the industrialists in the main, they were fearful about what could happen. What would happen if the workers genuinely tried to turn over the system and tried to kick out the government and kick out the employers and take over? Would it lead to chaos? Would it lead to what would happen exactly? So there was a fear amongst the ruling class uh, if conditions were not improved. So there were movements in the background, government movements and talk about trying to improve the lot of workers, trying to improve the conditions of workers so that revolution would not start, so that political agitation would stop and people would be more content. So there were uh, talks about trying to improve the conditions for workers. According to this quotation, Graham and Bennett, uh, industrial relations comprises all the rules, practices and conventions governing interactions between managements and their workforces, normally involving collective employee representation and bargaining. That's where it wanted to go, that's where it should have gone in a sense but it had to emerge. It, it should have in a sense gone there at the start but it can't. It can't have gone at the start because no one knew what the rule was. This was totally new. Um, the situation was new. Uh, England was an, ag an agricultural society and then it was industrial. Okay, There were pockets of industry of course uh, throughout England going way back but, but essentially there was a big movement of workers in the 1800s and in, in the 1700s as well, the late 1700s. There was movements of workers into industry and there was no framework for them to, to talk collectively to the management and try to improve their conditions, improve health and safety at work, improve their wages, improve their productivity uh, and get in a sense humane working conditions established. But because it was new, because no one knew what the rules were, uh, this was not going to happen. But 
that had to emerge. And in a sense, it had to emerge in parallel with the emergence of industry. The pressures for bringing it about were all around. Governments wanted it. They were afraid there would be a revolution and the, the government would be overthrown and uh, a situation like happened in France with the uh, the French Revolution could happen in England. So there were fears that uh, the ruling classes could, could suffer. Uh, the industrialists, some of them believed that the situation could not continue. It could continue for forever exploiting the the workers and exploiting their weakness in negotiations. So there were talk about how to to deal with this, um, but it was difficult to see a way forward. Employee relations, historically known as industrial relations, is a concept introduced for the maintenance of employer and employee relations or relationships. So employee relations uh, is when there's a more equal treatment of the workforce, uh, a more enlightened treatment of the workforce. But all of it had to be negotiated. All of it had to be won in a sense. A lot of it was the result of strikes and struggles and problems in the past. Uh, all of it had to be gained. Some of it was gained through negotiations, some of it was gained through enlightened management. A lot of it was gained through strikes and agitation. But out of it all there came um, a situation where the the workers got more rights and probably this was all to do as well with the, uh, the changing of Parliament and the way Parliament elected itself and uh, increasing democracy. Because as workers got votes they became more important and therefore uh, members of Parliament took their opinions into account because the members of Parliament wanted to be elected or re-elected the next time. And, um, so new legislation was introduced to uh, govern working practices uh, and gradually it all started to change and to emerge into what we've got today. The term employee relations has become increasingly common due to the nature of employment which has now become predominantly non-industrial. So we can see why the, the term has changed. In the past it was industrial relations because the majority of workers worked in industry. But now we have employee relations because the majority of workers work in the service sector, work in banks, insurance, in restaurants, uh, in tourism, in hotels and so on. So it's become employee relations, not industrial relations. There is a need to maintain strong employer-employee relationships in order to increase productivity and prof uh, profitability. Now we see employers and employees working together, trying to find better ways of working to become more efficient, to cut costs, because both sides recognize that their jobs are at stake, the business is at stake and the business must make a profit if it's going to survive. If it doesn't make a profit it'll go out of business and the jobs will be lost. So the employees and the employers have something in common. The survival of the business. So both are trying to look for efficiencies. Both are cooperating. Both working together to try and get a better business. So the situation from the time of the Industrial Revolution to now is totally different. It, it has transformed almost totally to, to such a level that people do no longer work in, in mines for long hours and under terrible conditions, dangerous conditions. It's regulated. There are laws and regulations governing it. And the majority of people work in the service sector. So we've even changed the name from industrial relations to 
employee relations. Employee relations involves maintaining employee and employer relations which results in productivity, motivation and morale. It's important that the employees have good morale and good motivation. That way they work harder, they, they apply themselves properly, they think about the job, uh, they have a voice, the management will listen to them, it's more enlightened. Uh, management can learn from the employees. The employees are the ones doing the work and will therefore have opinions and ideas about how the work should be conducted. So, as I said, the, the climate has changed radically. The aim of employee relations is to prevent conflict and resolve problems which arise in a work setting. That's what employee relations is about. It's trying to prevent conflict and, and to deal with issues, to deal with problems when they arise, and to deal with them fairly and openly and get a good resolution of the problem. Employee relations offers guidance and advice on best practice, approaches to poor employee performance and misconduct. So there is now a widespread sharing of ideas and what is best practice, what's the best way to move forward. And this, uh, I suppose, is uh, uh, signalled by the existence of a chartered institute. A chartered institute where professional people, people who are members of the, if you like, the employee relations sector, they can join the professional institute and get uh, courses and recommendations and case studies illustrating good practice. So there's a dissemination of good practice right throughout industry and the service sector. And this means that professionals working in employee relations understand what is, what is good what will motivate the workers, what will uh, increase productivity, increase uh, the, the performance of the workforce. And there is more stability in industry and in commerce as a consequence. Employee relations requires that organisations are made aware of policies and procedures for handling disciplinary and uh, disciplinary issues and grievances. So when there are disciplinary issues and grievances to be dealt with, there are procedures, there are set procedures that uh, can be um, gone through. They're not just made up on the spur of the moment. It's, it's all been done before, it's been thought about, and there's a set procedure. Employees are provided with information regarding company policies, goals, rights, regulations and legislation applicable to them. So the employees are very well informed, generally speaking. They should know what the goals of the company are, what their rights are, what are the regulations governing their particular type of employment, what legislation applies. They, they, they should be well aware of what's expected of them and the environment in which they work. Under employee uh, relations policies, employers must provide a safe working environment and prevent any mistreatment or discrimination. So the employees can feel that they're going to work to earn a living. They're not going to work to risk their lives or work in hazardous conditions. To, to run the risk of injury every day. They, they're working with full knowledge. They know what they're, they're doing, they know what's expected of them, and they expect the employers to make every effort to make their working lives safe. And they don't expect to be mistreated or abused or insulted. Uh, they don't expect discrimination because they look different from from the majority perhaps 
uh, or have a different religion or or perhaps dress differently have a different orientation they don't expect to be discriminated that does not affect their employment they can still do the job so why should it be treated differently so it's a much more enlightened approach recognizing diversity recognizing that people are different and that people go to work to earn a living and they don't expect to be hurt or discriminated against or mistreated the importance of employee relations is to protect employees and their rights including salary and wages so it's important that the employees have some protection uh, that their salaries and wages are calculated fairly and openly and they're not cheated and they get a, a living wage whatever that is deemed to be that the working conditions are safe and the employees can work and apply themselves without the worry of of hurt without the worry uh, of injury there will be an increased employee loyalty which results in high employee retention and a pleasant working place so when the employees see the management trying to help them to create a better environment in which they work to uh, look after their safety to treat them with respect the employees feel more contented they feel happier there's more produ productive uh, they try harder there's greater loyalty towards the employer and overall there's a better working atmosphere management are able to confidently deal with conflict and find suitable solutions when the environment is good and a problem arises there's much more willingness to uh, negotiate and find a solution there's no assumption that there was a, a planned or devious plot on the part of management or on the part of someone to to cause a problem or to upset someone else it was uh, perhaps issues do arise sometimes they can arise because of technical failure or because of changes in the environment or changes in the law but it's a question then of the employees and management getting together and finding a solution which is acceptable to both of them without conflict and if they start from a position of a good working relationship uh, it's a pleasant place to work if, if it starts from there there's more chance that when a problem arises it can be resolved amicably it helps to improve communications between employer and employees uh, <clears throat> back to the industrial revolution there was virtually no contact between management and employees the employees were told what to do and that was it but now we expect the management and the employees to talk uh, to get to know each other get to know what they're good at and what what can be said and not said and it's it's become social as well as work to some extent there is a communications the, <clears throat> certainly it's the case that the employees can communicate with management over work issues if uh, a problem arises if there's something dangerous that's just developed or if a machine is not working properly or if, uh, if some somebody spots a change which would be advantageous to the organization there's a channel for communicating with the management and the management have a channel to communicate with the employees so it's a much more enlightened environment now employee relations and human resource management have distinct functions employee relations well this concerns the practice of collective bargaining trade unionism labor management relations so that is employee relations it's to deal with uh, collective bargaining to to deal with issues that need to be confronted issues associated with remun remuneration 
issues with health and safety, working conditions. Uh, so these are issues that need to be fixed, need to be addressed before there is an effective workforce in place. Human resource management uh, engages in non-union employment uh, relations. It looks at the employee rights, policies and legislations within the organisation. It could also deal with issues like recruitment and uh, management of exit from the from the company and um, dealing with uh, issues during employment um, related to stress, related to overwork or uh, <clears throat> changes in the organisation, communications. Um, it's it's a much more em embrace of much wider function. So employee relations is to deal with collective bargaining, trade unionism, um, labour relations management, to deal with uh, what, what is it that the employees need in a in sort of fundamental way, the need a salary, the need good working conditions and the need good labour relations. Human resource management is an extra, it, it adds in the employee rights, the policies of the organisation, legislation, making sure that the, the business is within the legislation, uh, but it could also deal with issues associated with stress or health and safety issues, uh, training programmes, recruitment, so it's, it's wider. And <clears throat> that's our overview of employee relations, that's really all we're going to to do in this session. Uh, there's a, one of the sources that was mentioned uh, as we move through the class, uh, but that's all we're going to deal with now, so we're going to leave it at that and say thank you for watching.